So as I sit down, I always smile for some reason. It just kind of gets, I get a kick out of the privilege and the honor of being able to share Jesus in a personal and intimate way, relating those truths that God had shown me and sharing and relating that information that God has told me so that way other people can identify with God himself and begin to have a personal relationship with Jesus so they too could hear God speak as well as to walk with him and talk with him and have intimate fellowship. And so that's why I kind of smile when I sit down. I think, wow, you know, it's not like the hot seat. It's like, here's Jesus. Here we go. You know, Lord, what are you going to say? And I'm always excited by that. I'm always thrilled because he's always dealing with my life as well as the things that affect your life and in reality causing our life to become pleasing and acceptable in his sight. You know, I've been kind of taken back a little bit the recent couple of days because of this kind of comparative pictures that sometimes pop up on the internet. And this one was very graphic in the sense of the responses that people had to it. And I was shocked by those that should know better that somehow got tripped up by it. Because the pictures were a lie. They were fallacies that were trying to show some kind of stark realities of two opposite cultures and somehow the dichotomy of the differences that there existed between them as though one were evil and one were good. And neither one of them had accurate information. On the one side, it showed some girl asking for Santa to give her a 32 gigabyte uh, iPad and that she was crying because she didn't get it and she wanted a black 32 gigabyte and she got a 16 gigabyte white one instead and she was crying because she was disappointed and the picture shows a girl crying holding a box and the background doesn't really show any Christmas but you know it's there you know the idea and they they post the words on it that you could tell had been written on top of the picture then on the opposite side you see a pair of feet that are standing on with plastic bottles that I've seen down in Tijuana made that way, you know, for shoes. You know, and I, when I was a missionary in different countries, I've seen different things that were used in positive ways in order to make either shoes or other industrial things out of it. Well, the amazing thing to me was that this was a contrived post from a non-Christian site. As a matter of fact, the site was very obviously, once you went to the site where the picture came from, was very obviously a atheist site and it was kind of like one of those, you know, kind of like uh, National Enquirer sites, you know, where it's just a blog and a person's throwing up all kinds of stuff to shock jock you, you know, to get you excited and worked up. And it wasn't even a Christian message, which was interesting. It was just trying to show poverty versus prosperity and somehow as though both people were wrong or one person was right because they were poor and the other person was wrong because they were in a prosperous nation. Wrong! Don't you get it? I mean, that's what I wanted to shake some people and say, don't you get it? You're being manipulated. Satan wants you to side on the side of the poor people that, you know, here a person is standing on trash used as shoes in order to portray that being right and somehow this girl who didn't get what she wanted from Santa Claus being wrong even though that's a lie because nobody knows who the person is or whether or not that's what actually happened. As a matter of fact, it's pretty factual that that didn't happen, but that got added to it to try to make a quote-unquote comparison. Now, whenever people do comparisons, it's always interesting because they never tell the truth. They like to tell the opposite's extremes and try to make you jump into the middle somehow to make a decision one way or the other. You know, it's kind of like you have to do this or that. Well, that's not true. You see, even in God's will, you could turn to the left or you could turn to the right or you could be still. Now, there's three choices. It's never duality. And that's where a lot of times the what we used to call the Greek mentality comes into what we call the Gentile mentality the Gentile perspective. Because a Jew would always think of some other way, you know, probably come up with all these other conclusions. But unfortunately, in Christianity, a lot of Gentile idea, and I don't mean to say Jew versus Gentile, because Gentile, when I say Gentile, I mean Roman, Greco, 
philo philosophical ideas of the duality of thought, which is a theological premise that says that you have to be right or left. It has to be one way or the other. And with God, he says, no, it doesn't. Because he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. And sometimes they're even beyond your finding out. Oh. So I, in each one of these posts, kept saying, well, this is a false post, but pray about it. Ask Jesus, ask God to show you. Ask God to tell you. Because God said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will bring his own to all men liberally. So if you don't know the truth behind a post, you don't know the truth behind a picture, ask. God said he'd tell you. But see, that's the other part that's never said behind a picture. Or behind these posts. Or behind what people are doing. Their God is dead. No, really. I mean, don't get me wrong. They have a God, but they don't really call on God for everything. They don't lean on God for all understanding. They don't trust in the Lord with all their heart. Oh, sure, in some of the big things, you know, they'll pray and hope that it all works out. Or they'll say that, hey, I want to be put on a prayer list and leave it to them to pray. But where the rubber meets the road with God is what do you do in your everyday life? Do you ask Him to show you and reveal to you the truth? And then once you know the truth, what do you do with it? Well, praise the Lord, I, I was talking with one gal that was a uh, graduate of some type of background with Calvary Chapels. And praise the Lord, you know, some of it stuck. And after a while, though I wonder about the motivations, the person said, well, you know, I think I'll delete it because it might stumble someone. And I thought, well, yeah, that's one reason, but the other is because it's a lie. And it's false representation and misrepresentation of two opposites that Jesus never would have done. On the left hand, when you have a person who is in a prosperous nation, their trials, tribulations, challenges, and salvation is just as valid as a person who's in a poor country. You see, Jesus doesn't say, hey, look, because you're poor, you have a special place in my heart. Or because you're rich, you know, you have absolutely no way to get into heaven. Although he did say, woe unto those that are rich, because guess what? It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And that's true. And in a prosperous nation, we do see that true, as many Christians in America have a hard time with denying themselves about anything, much less asserting the fact that God said to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. Oh, they'll follow the prosperity and the popularity, but when it comes to trials and tribulations, eh, check me out, I'm on some other bandwagon. And so the hard part for me is to see how people can quickly be misled by somebody presenting what's called an improper comparison. It's called a fallacy. It's called a, a lie disguised as truth, where you are being told to compare one set of statements with another set of statements that don't apply to each other. You see, the person who is poor in a country that's wearing soap, uh, soda cans or soda plastic on his feet probably got those shoes from a dump, from the trash. Plastic shoes. Now, those shoes from a dump and from the trash means that the person was poor and that he probably you know, needed to find them there. And while it reminds some people of their own personal experiences, especially missionaries of going into other countries and making use of anything that's available, I've seen it in America, quite frankly. You know, I've been poor in America. I know what some of these things are by personal experience as well as people that live on the street. So on the one hand, you hear this, oh, you know, what a stark reality change between the two. You don't compare the two. A man poor in his country wearing soda cans for shoes is as much a sinner that needs grace as a person who wakes up in the morning and needs an iPad or an iPod or whatever. You see, it's not a question of one versus the other. It's a question of the heart of both. The heart of the man needs to be dealt with as he is, where he is, the way he is, for who he is. And God does that in his equality with both people. He doesn't say, oh, you poor, poor man, 
because you're so poor, I'm going to give you salvation automatically without ever having to come to the realization of my son and accepting him and what he's done on the cross for your salvation. No, he doesn't say that. He says, look, you need to repent the same way that that gal needs to repent. Both pictures should have the word across, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means that both, likewise, need to find Jesus. And that's where the failure sometimes I think of people doing causes rather than Christianity is all about. It's not about social causes. It's not about trying to make things work for your idea of what you think the gospel is by bringing America to some country and making them democratic because, quite frankly, you may not have known this, but democracy is not a God-inspired idea. I'm sorry. We the people, for the people, and other people is not a God-given idea. It is rather God's position that he puts someone in charge and then we are accountable to that person and God can change the heart of that person. God originally intended that man was ruled by him and had personal relationship and was required to get along with each other. Instead, we now forfeit our own personal liberty to the position of a group of people whom we don't know and don't keep track of so that they can make decisions based upon their own feelings and ideas and coordinate things in a democratic republic that supposedly represents the person and the individual which a committee could never do. A representation of a person is by a representation of a person. It's called one-to-one. -one. Jesus is the representation of God the Father. The church is not the representation of Jesus. The individual is the representation of Jesus. As Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples and that you have love for one another and that as God is revealed in us and God becomes alive through us, then God reveals himself to us as well as to the world around us. God doesn't do it through the entire volume of the people that are involved in Christianity. God does it in the person, the individual, as he speaks one-to-one -one with someone else. It's a one-to-one -one experience. It's a one-to-one -one God. It is called relationship. You can't have a relationship of governance when you have a democracy because you're not dealing one-to-one. -one. You're dealing with this megalop megalopolis out there that even when the Greeks who said one man, one vote, couldn't make it work. And they proved that it didn't work, even in their own Greek Roman state. And as it progressed into the democracy that we have from Rome, which is where we got it from, which ought to be a warning sign in and of itself, we found that, oh, it's not working today. As a matter of fact, if you look at the current elections, I don't know about you, but I don't see anybody representing me, <laughs> except Jesus. And you see, that's the point. It's about the representation that God gives us as opposed to what we think man should do. And the representation that was done in this picture was so wrong and so evil that it misrepresented God. And Christians jumped on it as though it were some type of, wow, a new gospel. And I kept saying, God, this is disgusting. How could people even get deceived into this? And that's the point that we need to be careful of. Don't be deceived by what looks good and you think is good. Rather, turn to God and ask Him because He created the world and then when He was done, He said, it is good. Only trust God for what is good because Jesus said, call, no, call nothing good. Don't call yourself good. Don't call me good. But there's only one good and that is your Father in heaven. He alone is good. Everything else, to put it bluntly, is under corruption and the curse, but God, our Father, is good. So if you want to know what is good, and what is right, what is holy, and what is pure in His sight, ask Him. The reality is He wants to speak to you and He wants you to know from Him and then depend on Him. God wants to be in personal relationship with you in an interpersonal dynamic that causes you to rely on Him in everything. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. We are foolish if we go out thinking we know anything at all. For the Bible says that if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all. But rather we need to go to God with every single detail of the life we're living. 
with every single choice we make and every word we take, that we open up our mouths and we begin to speak. And everything that we write, we should give it to God so it is plain in His sight and He can tell us what He wants to, as opposed to what we want to do. The king held out the golden scepter, so Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. It shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. For through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. We have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need and grace to help in time of need. God wants us always to come to him with everything so that he can speak to us about anything that he has on his mind for us to accomplish in our lives so we might extend grace and mercy to those that are in need. The person that tells me, oh, look how poor that person is, I say, good, now go and meet that need. The person who tells me to compare it with where we are, I say, well, good, sell all that you have, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Don't tell me and try to influence me with your propaganda of guilt that Satan himself tries to make us fear with a guilty conscience those things that we know that God has not placed in his word to cause us to do something, but we rather obey as we are told to do today what we hear his voice speaking to us as he relates to us in a personal intimate way. Satan is alive and well and wanting you to be involved in causing other people to feel guilty. Satan is alive and well and wants you to be distracted by causing other people to be excited about some deviation that isn't the exaltation of what God has done for the person and the individual. In the circumstances and the situation that I just gave you, God can save both of those people if we choose to pray. But the reality is, is that people that have looked at that picture, except for me, you know, when I posted it and put down the comments beneath it, but and I didn't post a picture, but I said, you know, should take a picture off, but I put comments under it so there's a balance. But the picture should have provoked everyone to say, well, let's pray for both people, not one or the other. And that's where the division that Satan always tries to cause by confusion always comes in. It is wanting and seeking to divide by separation of the two in opposition as though somehow one person's plight is not the same as the other person's, whether in poverty or whether in prosperity, whether in sickness or in health whether in disease or whether in need. Both parties needed, though the one may not have thought so, the other one was obvious. And in each circumstance and situation, we are told to come to the throne of grace that we may obtain grace to give to those in need. That's the point. God wants to be God in that situation where man wants to play God instead.